Today, professional football is played in the nation's largest cities. But at the turn of the century, the roots of the game took hold in rural America, where small-town rivalries were the lifeblood of the early pro game. The fiercest rivalry of all was contested in the shadow of the Ohio Hospital for the Insane. The rivals were the Canton Bulldogs and the Massillon Tigers. It wasn't until 1920 that Ralph Hay, owner of the Canton Bulldogs, arranged a meeting to interest investors in forming a league. Despite its new name, the National Football League operated on a casual basis and teams popped up and died from year to year. What the sport needed was a drawing card. In 1925, it got just that. George Haller signed Red Grange, the Galloping Ghost, and the Chicago Bears toured the country and capitalized on his name. But the prosperity Grange brought the Bears was short-lived. Professional football still lacked structure. One man alone could not make the game. Enter George Preston Marshall, the owner of the Washington Redskins the master showman who introduced halftime shows, a team song, and a marching band. Most important, Marshall suggested that the league be divided into two divisions, with the division champions meeting for a world title. While George Preston Marshall provided structure for the NFL, a rotund man from Philadelphia provided leadership and stability. That man was Burt Bell. Bell equalized the league's talent through the player draft. Still, there were empty seats. Bell then proposed to bring his game to the people through television. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Well, there you have it. There's the uh, voice of God. That is John Facenda talking about the beginnings of the National Football League. And uh, that's the topic that we're going to be on uh, focus with today. Uh, My name is Tim Hanlon. This is Good Seats, still available, that curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. And uh, we welcome you to uh, this week's proceedings. Thanks for uh, stopping by. Uh, and downloading us and putting us into your earbuds. And uh, that uh, clip uh, uh, featuring uh, Mr. Facenda and his uh, his dulcet tones and the uh, and the work that uh, uh, legendarily uh, was uh, part of his life professionally with uh, NFL films uh, comes from a, uh, a little uh, documentary that uh, hasn't really been sort of uh, circulating all that much uh, of late. Uh, it is the 1983 documentary. Uh, that aired on HBO called The History of Pro Football. And uh, I thought that little snippet was um, a perfect little uh, entree into our conversation this week with uh, our return guest, John Eisenberg. Uh, And if you remember, a few weeks back, we had a a wonderful conversation about uh, Dallas, Texas and football in the early 1960s, uh, the 10-gallon war being that uh, book that uh, John wrote. Uh, and that uh, battle for a good three years or so between the uh, AFL's Dallas Texans and the NFL's Dallas Cowboys. Uh, that was the early 60s. Uh, but uh, John's uh, John's work that we're going to be talking about today is uh, more recent and just came out. It's called The League, How Five Rivals Created the NFL and Launched a Sports Empire. And and while that uh, uh, the topic in the, this book uh, don't necessarily directly talk about teams or leagues uh, that are defunct or no longer with us or forever uh, somehow forgotten. There's a whole lot of implications and a lot of uh, stories around uh, the NFL, especially in its formative years, uh, how uh, teams uh, and leagues continually threatened and challenged uh, what is now the uh, supreme sport, shall we say, in the United States that being the National Football League. It's a fascinating uh, story, and it's a journey back to the earliest days of the National Football League. And uh, you heard uh, three of the uh, uh, the most uh, famed uh, founders of this league, George Hallis, 
uh, Burt Bell, certainly George Preston Marshall, uh, but uh, also uh, Tim Mara, he of the uh, the originator of the New York Giants and uh, whose family still uh, runs and controls the team today, as well as uh, Art Rooney, the founder and uh, the uh, the family of which still uh, runs the Pittsburgh Steelers. Those two plus Messrs. Hallis, uh, Preston Marshall and Bell uh, arguably uh, are the uh, the foundational elements uh, of this uh, thing called the National Football League and without whom uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s uh, and even later, uh, this league that we know today, uh, warts and all, yet very successful in, 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 at that, would not be half of what it is uh, today. That's the topic uh, of conversation uh, with our guest, John Eisenberg, uh, the author of The League uh, and all of the uh, interesting uh, early days uh, and of survival, for sure. We're going to talk about that uh, with John in just a couple of seconds. Um, let's get some uh, promotional stuff uh, in front of you and then uh, uh, expeditiously out of the way. Uh, we want to thank our friends at uh, 503 Sports. Uh, they fancy themselves as the, uh, the king of throwbacks, and uh, we are more than happy to oblige them with that title. Uh, and uh, if you visit them at 503-sports, dot com or 503 sports.com your preference whatever you'd like uh you will uh, enjoy and see uh all that they have to, uh, to offer uh in the realm of things uh especially clothing uh from teams and leagues no longer with us it's fascinating stuff and not only is it t-shirts uh with great logos and and, and uh, memories but also lovingly crafted uh, custom made uh throwback jerseys from Lots of different sports and leagues, especially football. Uh, and if you remember uh, or were fans of teams in the old XFL, uh, perhaps the old World League of American Football, remember that one? How about the WFL, the World Football League, that ill-fated year-and-a-half league that we've talked about in a couple of other episodes? Uh, those in other leagues, as well as in other sports, you're going to find uh, some very cool, uh, high-quality, reconstructed uh, jerseys uh, with historical accuracy, uh, at 503 sports, 503 hyphen or dash sports.com. Uh, take a look at this stuff. It's really cool. It's some USFL stuff. Uh, our Jeff Perlman interview from a number of weeks ago. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're hankering for a Tampa Bay bandits Jersey, this is your place, uh, 503 sports. And if you use a promo code, which we're going to give to you right now, seats, S E A T S spell it correctly. Will you? 503sports, uh, sorry, 503-sports.com. Use that promo code SEATS, and you're going to get 10% off of all of your purchases. So check them out. Uh, you're going to love them. And uh, there's some more great stuff that they have uh, coming up. And uh, I, I assure you, uh, you will be the envy of your neighbors uh, and uh, and your workplace uh, by uh, surprising with uh, a WFL jersey from the past or a you know a Barcelona Dragons uh, uh, uniform from... Uh, from the old uh, World League of American Football and such. Uh, and uh, that's the place to go. 503 Sports. It's 503-sports.com. Promo code SEATS. Oldschoolshirts.com, uh, not to be outdone, if you're just simply looking for a T-shirt, but a high-quality one and a distressed look at that. Uh, from a wide array of teams and leagues and logos, uh, no longer with us, otherwise defunct or reincarnated, uh, this is the place to go. Oldschoolshirts.com. Uh, and uh, we got a promo code for you there for 10% off all your purchases. That is good seats. Good seats. That's the promo code at oldschoolshirts.com. P.F. Wilson and his team in Cincinnati are the uh, uh, the perpetrators of such. And uh, we uh, encourage you to t check them out. And it's not just uh, pro sports, but also uh, things like amusement parks and and old radio stations and and the logos behind those two. It's really it's just cool pop culture stuff. Uh, and you're going to enjoy this thoroughly, I assure you. Some great pricing, some good discounting of late, and uh, you uh, can only add to those savings by using our promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases. That's oldschoolshirts.com. Now, last but not least is Dean Mitchell and his friends in beautiful San Diego, California. Boy, do we wish we were there now. Uh, but alas, we are not, but we can be uh, transported there through this interwebs thing. Uh, to the site that he and his team have put together called SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. And that's Memorabilia Central USA for, uh, let's see, stuff from teams and leagues uh, no longer with us. Hey, you sense a theme here? 
Uh, that's uh, programs and pennants and buttons and stickers and, you know, and, and, and what else? We had schedules and, and, and media guides and uh, historical uh, uh, books and articles. And, and it's it's an amazing assemblage. And, and Dean and his, uh, his pals put together uh, new stuff just about every week on the site. And uh, it's uh, it's it's like finding it. You know, it's going to that that special garage sale and finding all those treasures that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you just can't believe somebody's uh, wants to sell or toss away. Uh, and they're all there and, and all the memories come flooding back, I assure you. So check them out. The site is great. You got the great photography there, but the items uh, are awesome, too. And you might want to purchase just a few. And of course, when you want to do that, use that promo code good seats there and get 15 percent off all of your purchases at sports history collectibles dot com. And uh, use that promo code good seats. Uh, 15 percent off will be yours. Enjoy it on us and enjoy all the items that you get sent to you speedily by Dean and friends at sports history collectibles.com. Thank you to all three of you folks, fine folks, fine groups of folks for sponsoring this little show and uh, giving us uh, some support when we need it most. Uh, and uh, we hope that you now will enjoy uh, our fun and interesting conversation with uh, the great John Eisenberg, our repeat guest, uh, one of a very few number of repeat guests, as we talk about his book about the early days and the uh, and the uh, the early years, the early decades of the National Football League, and his book's called The League. And uh, here's our chat that we had just a few weeks ago. Why don't you remind our our audience uh, who you are, uh, what you do, and how you uh, got to uh, going back in time to kind of uh, definitively, I think. Uh, get to some of the uh, the essence of the National Football League from its earliest days. Well, uh, I am. Uh, I've been. Uh, I was thinking about it uh, recently. I, I've been a sports writer since the late seventies. I believe this is my fortieth football season that I've covered, which makes me sound really old. Uh, I like to don't like to think I'm old, but I think I am old at forty years of covering football professionally. But uh, anyway, uh, I started in Dallas, Texas, and I moved to Baltimore in the 80s. Uh, I was the columnist of the Baltimore Sun for 25 years. And uh, along the way, I started writing books. And I have written now uh, this, the league that is out as my 10th book. Uh, I've g- done some different sports, baseball, horse racing. Uh, lately, I've really focused on football. I've written, I believe, four books of football history. Uh, several on the early days of pro football in Dallas, where I grew up. And, uh, you know, that one, uh, uh, there have been two of those. And then uh, I wrote one on Vince Lombardi's first year in Green Bay in 1959. Not the years that he won the title, but the year where he came there and inherited the worst team in the league. And basically how he put in motion the forces that uh, enabled him to become such a dominant coach in the 60s. I found a lot of material there. And I think it all sort of set me up. I've written 4,000 columns, and I've been to most of the football stadiums, and I, I think I'm something of an expert on it. And, and I've always viewed the early days of the NFL as very ripe storytelling terrain, just uh, unbelievable with the, the characters and the NFL bear, bearing little resemblance to what it is now and uh, the leatherhead players, and, and it was just a wild time. And so I wound up uh, striking a deal an editor in New York at Basic Books uh, to sort of tell the story of the early days of the NFL, not so much the Leatherhead players, but uh, the owners. I I felt the really interesting story was this league almost went under a few times and for many years was just sort of a failing enterprise. How in the world, who who kept it going and how in the world did they do that? Did I keep the NFL going when it was an unpopular, not unpopular, but not very popular sport? and uh, set it up to succeed later. What's the story behind that? So uh, I feel like a lot of years sort of put me in the right place to tell this story. Well, um, there's no question that, uh, and we've, we've sort of danced around this a little bit uh, in, in previous episodes, the, um, you know, the, the beginnings and the, frankly, the, uh, the years after the beginnings of the NFL, right? Uh, very much uh, ragtag, uncertain, uh, not guaranteed success, uh, and by no means uh, even close to uh, what we know today of the NFL being, you know, it's multi-billion dollar, uh, arguably uh, uh, heady and most, uh, you know, uh, substantial status 
of all the sports leagues in this country. Um, but it, it strikes me in in reading uh, some of this book that uh, I'm going to inject my sort of thematics on here, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. It, it almost feels like one of the major themes, not only of this book, but of the history of the league, especially uh, in the uh, the early years and its formative years, is almost one of sort of existential survival, uh, both from internal sources and 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 the process of of running uh, and, and keeping owners and and then the players and the game and all that kind of stuff, but also from external uh, sources, right? The challengers, it seems, almost uh, from the, from its beginning days. Uh, and literally, you know, uh, more challengers to come in the, even in the next two years, right, with the, uh, the rebirth of the XFL and the, uh, the Alliance of American Football. So am I right to sort of assume or maybe project, I guess, a bit of uh, uh, existential uh, survival as almost one of the sort of th- thematics here for this story? No, I think that's very good. That's a, a very keen analysis uh, because – uh, number one, I mean, most people would say today, what is the point of it? And people would say, well, you're wealthy, you know, because there's so much money on the table, $14 billion in annual revenues. And the people that own the, that own the teams are Titans of industry and most of them. And so you just think, well, this is a money game. Well, the, the era I'm talking about, there just wasn't much money on the table at all. Uh, they're, they're, they, 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 I mean, no TV revenue and very little radio revenue, the rights and tickets, not a lot of people buying tickets. There just wasn't any money to be made. And the, these, these men that I'm writing about are, uh, not even thinking about getting wealthy from pro football. They are, as you said, just trying to survive. They thought it was an interesting idea. Uh, really the early days of football, you go back to the, the 1800s when it was formed, uh, started being played into the early 1900s. Football was seen as a character building exercise for young boys. Uh, it was, and that was, it's seen by many as its role in society, not a sport so much. It was a sport, but you know, they wanted, let's, let's make men out of our boys. And so high school football was popular. College football was popular. And uh, the idea of paying someone to, to play football was thought to be just disrespectful, disgusting, cheap. Uh, you know, who would ever do that? A scourge on society. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the people, especially those high in the amateur games, thought it was horrible. So pro football had to overcome that. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, for the longest time thought to be sort of uh, just, uh, you know, almost an insult to the very sport that it was at football. So yeah, I mean, it had, it had to deal with that uh, and so much to overcome. They weren't thinking about getting wealthy. They just thought in the long run, let's play it with men. It might be a better game. It might be really interesting. And look at baseball with cities, you know, teams in cities represented and uh, how popular it could be. They thought, well, we can do the same thing with football in the long run. They ultimately were right. But uh, for many years, it wasn't clear that that these cities would take to these teams. And so the fight was just, yes, to stay alive. And there were other leagues that came along. Everything was very sort of slapdash and a league would would uh, just sort of gin up, you know, a couple of cities thought, oh, we'll have a team and uh, they have a league. And so there were a lot of threats. And yes, they were just trying to get by and keep themselves going for the most part. So, you know, let, let's maybe circle around sort of the the origins of this, and then we'll get maybe sort of to the main, I guess, protagonists that sort of evolved in here. But, I mean, you're you're talking about, you know, circa 1920 or so, right, when uh, the quote-unquote powers that be decided that, you know what, that there's this professionalism around this sport that uh, may actually make some sense here. And baseball probably gave them a bit of uh, – some some insight into doing so, right? Baseball having a good 40, almost 50 year head start, I guess, in terms of, you know, translating things from amateurism into uh, frisky, shall we say, professionalism and and professionalism actually having some negative connotations associated with it in the very earliest of years. Um, maybe some insight into the primordial ooze, I guess, of this league sort of coming together uh, loose and or, uh, you know, uh, not fully formed, I guess, as, as it might have been. Well, what it was in the beginning was 
really what it wasn't just I mean it was cities but uh, the real origins origins of pro football is sort of this industrial America uh, a lot of uh, companies would start teams just semi pro ball and uh, that's actually how Hallis got started George Hallis with the Chicago Bears the AE Staley company a starch maker in Decatur Illinois invited him to start a company football team. And so he moved from Chicago. He's working for the railroad there. And he moves to Decatur, starts his football team. Uh, they give him money, he brings in all Americans, and they play a bunch of other industrial league teams or, you know, team, just other cities. Are, it's all in the Midwest, little industrial town. You really understand where the Green Bay Packers came from. Uh, you know, it was all these little little cities for the most part playing on sandlot ball. And so there were just uh, dozens of them, and, and they would come, they would go, they would not draw many people. Uh, Hallis lasted one year in Decatur before A.E. Staley said, this isn't going to work here, we can't, that football's expensive, and we can't, we can't uh, draw enough fans, sell enough tickets to pay for this team. So we basically let Hallis have the team. Hallis moved it to Chicago, and then the rest is history. The, the Chicago Bears uh, were born in 1921. Well, that's a typical story, uh, the, the only difference being that the franchise was allowed to continue. Most of them just went out of business. And, uh, yes, the Dayton Triangles and, and uh, you know, the, the Rock Island Independence, and there was just all these teams uh, from the Midwest on through the East, uh, uh, you know, all these sort of hard scrabble little teams that lasted for a few years and were just gone. So that, that's really where pro football started. Uh, it, but it almost seems like it had some uh, some initial challenges really early on from uh, either other, I guess, professional rival leagues or maybe even those leagues that weren't even that, right? I mean, we kind of hinted at some of or, or touched on some of the sort of industrialness quality, I guess, of uh, the, these these teams as well uh, when we talked about some of the uh, some of the early basketball pro leagues. Um, I guess I'm just wondering generally, uh, how would you describe sort of the uh, the early years of professional football, uh, and where there would be even even the remotest hint that it could actually be competed against with another league or two? Well, that's interesting because uh, by 1925, the man who was in charge of the league, Joe Carr, uh, was the president of the league. He today they would call him the commissioner. Uh, he was from a sports writer from Columbus, Ohio. They'd hired him uh, to run the league, Hallis and these guys. And Joe had made the realization, the very fundamental one, that the small town stuff wouldn't work. They needed to put teams in large cities. And so it was never going to work unless you had teams in New York, Chicago, Boston, everywhere. So the NFL was in the process of trying to do that. And uh, so there was suddenly the New York Giants in 1925. The Bears were already in existence. And there was a team in Cleveland and Milwaukee. And they were starting to have slightly larger, larger cities. The industrial thing was gone within a decade, completely gone. Uh, so it, it was starting to win away, winnow away right there. But I guess people saw that and, and thought, uh, golly, there's this interest in this stuff. And these cities do have teams. There are some crowds occasionally for these games. So let's start a league. So um, 1926 was the first American Football League uh, started by the promoter who had Red Grange under contract. Uh, Red played for the Bears in 1925 and, and was a sensation and drew great crowds. But it was just a, a, just a limited contract. And Red was so popular that the, this promoter said with C.C. Pyle, said, well, we'll have our own league. So they started a league with him, and this was all big city teams, Philadelphia, New York, Cleveland, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't last very long. Red got hurt, uh, and, and no one had heard. The appetite for pro football wasn't big enough yet in the country. So there was people that thought it might work, but uh, there was another American Football League in 1936, pretty much the same thing, just not enough appetite yet to really support teams uh, uh, in cities, uh, you know, other than the ones where these franchises that were getting established, like the Giants and the Bears. So these first two versions of the AFL, one uh, being in 1926 and the, the second being in, um, I guess, for two seasons, right? 36, 37? Right. 
uh, or maybe yes. one overlapping season. Um, was uh, the NFL uh, brain trust, and we'll get to some of these names and, and their their origins and their sort of inclinations in a minute. Um, was there any sort of rallying cry to defend against uh, against these uh, interlopers uh, at that time, or was it kind of where they were still kind of trying to figure out how to stabilize their own entity, let alone uh, fend off a potential challenger? Because it doesn't seem like, I mean, I guess in some respects, you wonder why the competition at all, given how, you know, uh, not even close to being fully formed in terms of its uh, attractiveness, I guess, right? You're mentioning it's it's occasionally uh, well attended. It's, uh, you know, I, but it seems to me like it's still pretty, you know, pretty loose and a little haphazard and, and still very formative. Yes, uh, I would say there were both of those uh, emotions that you mentioned. Uh, very definitely, although uh, you know, it, was, it was very, there was very much a feeling of we have to defend our turf. We cannot let this go away. By the 1936 one, that's, uh, the NFL was what, 16 years old? Uh, it was starting to find itself. They'd instituted a championship game. They had instituted rules that opened up the game to the forward pass. The game was getting better by the mid, mid-30s towards the late 30s. This new league comes along. The New York Giants were drawing crowds in New York. The Bears were popular. So there was a little bit of substance there. And, you know, by golly, they weren't going to lose it. And it was all pretty much distilled in New York. It was very constantly. That is Tim Mara, who owned the Giants. Uh, was constantly uh, being challenged. When these new leagues came along, they always put a team in New York and said, we're going to take the Giants down. Uh, and then and that's how we're going to, we, we will gain our bona fides as a, as a league. So he was constantly under threat uh, with the Red Grange League in 26. And then there was another team in 36. And, you know, it was always, it was even the case where you go all the way to the AFL in the 1960s, right? There was always a New York team. So, so uh, he was under threat and took it very personally, great challenges, and was determined uh, to eradicate those leagues and those teams. So that, that emotion was very much in play. We, we, we've staked a little bit of turf here, and we don't want to lose it. All right, so maybe this is an opportunity. And I'm wondering, is this around the time sort of these, uh, these five owners that you uh, thread throughout, uh, throughout this book, um, was this so, sort of – these sort of existential challenges from the outside, was that galvanizing or was it, were they kind of more together and, and uh, you know, similarly aligned even before, say, the AFL, whether whether it be a minor league uh, industrial version of such or a fully fledged professional AFL in name? I don't think that, that those challenges were particularly galvanizing. They were worried about it a little. I think they the challenges themselves always kind of fizzled out. Uh, they all sort of committed suicide. They they were not very well organized, and, and they might have had a good team or two, but there wasn't a lot of competition, and so it just sort of fizzled out. They were they were more worried about themselves and and improving their product, and that is the great story of the early years of the NFL. Uh, you know what? How did they do it? The the global question here: How they did it is by continually focusing on the game more than the business of the game. The business of the game, of course, was crucial. I mean, they wanted to stay afloat more than get rich, but they were constantly refining the game. Uh, rules to open it up to more offense. Uh, as I said before, creating a championship, a postseason had not existed for the first 13 years. They just, with the season ended, whoever had the best record was the winner. So, you know, created a, 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 dr- a dramatic culmination but there was all this stuff going on. Uh, the draft, a key moment where Burt Bell in Philadelphia couldn't get any players. There was there was no system for distributing the college talent coming into the pros. And so the good teams got all the good players and it only was getting worse. So Burt Bell, who was a have not in Philadelphia. So we have to do this. We have to have this draft. And uh, to me, it's like the seminal moment of all. Hallis and Tim Mara looked at the plant, looked at each other and said, you know what? He's right. He is right. We're going to we're going to be boring. We might be out of business if we can't have a level playing field and people beating us. Okay? And so they signed on for the draft, knowing that it would level the playing field eventually, which it did. So these guys were more concerned about their own product than any challenges. I think they felt like they had a better they could they could outlift at last those guys. But 
focusing on their game and their sport was what carried them and making it better uh, slowly but surely is, is what is really the story of the first 20, 30 years of the NFL. All right. Well, let's let, let's name some names. Right. So there are five major owners here from from these earliest days that uh, that you circle uh, around in, in this book to uh, essentially uh, show the, uh, the the chain link fence, if you will, of stability and or um, a solid foundation for this league. Uh, George Hallis, was, we, we talked about, uh, we, you mentioned Tim Mara, of course, uh, Burt Bell, whose uh, son Upton we had on a previous episode, some some interesting uh, memories from his childhood of of some of those days, but also two others, Art Rooney, right, of Pittsburgh, and George Preston Marshall of the Washington Redskins. W- what is it about these five guys, uh, individually and collectively, how do they even sort of mesh, shall we say, at least uh, as a... Uh, a joint effort to get sort of this league uh, going? How do they, and why would you say, I'm sure each of them had individual reasons for doing so, that were they even willing even to throw their uh, collective interest into this this fledgling thing called the NFL? Well, they were like-minded in the sense that uh, they did believe in this. They believed in this project. They came to it at different times. Hallis in 1920, Mara in 1925, uh, the other three in the early 30s is when their franchises began. So more than uh, 10 years apart. But by the early 30s, the mid-30s that I'm talking about, they were together. And they did believe in this professional football. And so they just came to it with this feeling that we can we can make this work. I mean, we're not, uh, we, we are not trying to get rich off doing this. Uh, uh, George Preston Marshall was a a laundry man. He had a chain of laundries in Washington. He was fairly wealthy. Burt Bell had been born to the manor in mainline Philadelphia and had blown all his money. Uh, so he, he wasn't necessarily, no, no one was going to come in and save these guys. They just had this idea. And I circled these five because one, one of the best things I did, uh, one of the great research tools on this book is there's a volume at the hall of fame, the research library there that has the official minutes of every league minute going, uh, I'm sorry, of every league meeting going back to 1920, the original meeting. So you can go in there, this, this volume never leaves the hall of fame, never leaves the library room. You can go in there and just sit and read it. And so these voices come alive. Uh, you can sort of go take yourself back to these meetings. And you can really see what unfolded and who was a player. And these were the guys that were doing all the work. The, that were these rule changes I'm talking about and the playoffs and the ones that just saw the business of the, of the they saw the game and they saw that it needed to change and they were the ones that worked on it. The other, I mean, there were a couple of other guys at Curly Lambeau, a huge figure in the history of pro football in Green Bay. But if you go back and read those minutes, he was not necessarily in there changing rules and leading these arguments like these other guys were. These were headstrong sharp, shrewd sort of men of sports. And the, the dynamic between them is just fascinating because they didn't always get along. Uh, a lot of them, I mean, there was a couple of, you know, Irish guys that had tempers, you know, the old cliche, and they fought bitterly at times and tried to beat each other and tried to cheat each other and did everything. But push came to shove at the, the, the key moments. They understood they were partners in, in the football business, the pro football business. And they always did like that example I gave with the draft. They always, when there were these key moments, they realized we have to do this. We have to put uh, the collective ahead of our own best interests. And over and over again, they did it. And slowly but surely this league first mentality arose and it was just a huge thing. It's really it's really what enabled this league to work, that they all realized they could put put the sport ahead of their own interests and make it go. So just a, a fascinating dynamic. I mean, uh, some of these guys had tempers. Art Rooney was the peacemaker. Uh, Burt Bell was the raconteur, the storyteller. Uh, you know, Tim Mara was a little older. He was, a, you know, the bookie. He was a legal bookmaker. House was the football man. I mean, they all sort of had roles and, and, and it all just meshed and they didn't even know it at the time, I'm sure, but uh, slowly, but surely uh, they, they, they just carried this league through some tough years. They didn't sort of, uh, you know, necessarily 
get together or get get along well on the field, right? It seemed like when it came to competition that they were they played the roles well of of rivals, but behind the scenes, right? When the, when push came to shove and the enterprise was at stake, they sort of kind of recognized that on field is not the same thing as off field and profitability, right? Oh, well, there's this great moment. I believe it's the 1937 championship game. It's the Bears and the Redskins. And so it's uh, George Preston Marshall and Hallis, two incredibly competitive, headstrong guys that loved each other and hated each other. And, you know, uh, I mean, they understood this whole business dynamic. So their teams are playing. There's a fight on the field, right? Hallis is the coach. George Preston Marshall's in the stands, and he goes running down to the field, and Hallis almost hits him. They almost get into a fight, and so the fight clears, and uh, Marshall goes back to his seat. He's sitting there with his wife, and his wife says, that house is the worst guy I've ever seen. I can't stand him. And Marshall, who almost has fought with him, turns to her and says, don't you dare say that. He's my best friend. And so that's a, that really distills it all right there. They, they, they would literally fight on the fields, but uh, when it came to it, they were best friends and partners. So how long did this sort of club, if you will, kind of zeitgeist last? Because it seems to me like what's been established here is, uh, shall we say, some rules of the road and some um, general understanding amongst men uh, about maybe how this should evolve, uh, how the rules should come into play, uh, the roles and the, the rivalries and all that kind of stuff, whether it's, you know, real or feigned. Um it feels to me, though, that that the war, the Second World War, was kind of almost the maybe the, one of the galvanizing events, right, where it was really it wasn't a league. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, baseball or other sports, the sort of competition for leisure time. It was truly, you know, an existential challenge uh, in that the nation was now part of a global con- conflict and. Uh, in many respects, uh, pro football and sports overall, for that matter, professional especially, was, you know, maybe a distraction and uh, an entertainment for a, a war-weary country. But, you know, the, the the real challenge to the NFL was very, very substantial, right? I mean, it was it was not certain that they were going to even survive the war years. Is that a fair assumption? No, no. Totally, totally fair, because the war, they've been in business 21 years when uh, 22 years when the war begins. And so, yes, they had established some roots by then, uh, drawing crowds in 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 Chicago, in Washington. Uh, you know, they, they were definitely uh, the Giants. You know, they, they had some real rivalries going. But once the war came. Uh, and, and half the league is enlisted suddenly. I mean, half the, the players are gone. They did make the decision to go ahead and play. They didn't always agree. Art Rooney did not want to play. I mean, he had he, he didn't think it would be, he, it was a good idea to, to sell the public a diluted product. Uh, but they, they had enough guys to play. I mean, these guys with deferments and, you know, guys with medical, you know, with one eye receiver. And, and uh, it was a, truly the wounded warriors. But uh the guys couldn't fight, but they went ahead and played, and it, it was rough. I mean, they they had teams aside from the fact that uh, uh, you know not you know the, some fans you know a lot of fans didn't always have money for tickets or they were uh, too busy with the war. I mean, it was just a, a challenging time. Uh, but uh, the quality of the ball wasn't as good. But uh, the strangest thing happened uh, in the war is uh, attendance started to go up. Uh, they felt that, uh, you know, some of the college games, some colleges were not fielding teams for those reasons. And people wanted some sort of leisure time. And they 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 liked pro football. I mean, they found that pro football was the only football around. And so people came to it. Uh, they survived the war, even though it had great, great challenges to them. And the Steelers had to merge. They merged one year with the Philadelphia Eagles. They They merged another year with the Chicago Cardinals. Barely making it there, but the legendary Card Pit team. Card Pit was uh, 1944. They played ten games. They lost them all. And uh, I believe the story I have in the book is the best player on the team just walked away uh, uh, with a game or two left in the season. Just couldn't take it anymore. So they were not good. Uh, but uh, the end. So I, I think looking back, they were real. They had eight teams. There was a real challenge whether or not they would survive it. But uh, attendance did go up. 
And so they, they ended the war with real momentum and the feeling that, uh, like a lot of other sports, they were ready to sort of come into their own after, after the war ended. And, and that is what happened. Yeah, we had a really good conversation. One of our earliest uh, conversations with uh, Matt Algio um, on the Steagles, 1943 Steagles. He had another sort of uh, marriage of convenience uh, to sort of sort of hold on. And, <laughs> and so, but besides that, though, right? So uh, maybe that's a, that's a real testament to uh, the um, I don't know the creativity and the uh, resourcefulness uh, and the uh, shared uh, uh, interest. Uh, of these five in particular uh, to, you know, to really circle the wagons and do what needed to be done to keep the thing alive and running, uh, especially with a couple of little blips of, uh, of popularity as attendance sort of to peak a little bit. Yeah, I think the Art Rooney example in World War II is, is really the ultimate example in, in some respects. He he was finally, the Steelers, they, they, were, they were the pirates for the first seven years and then he changed the name. Uh, whatever their name was, they were not good. They were bad. They were having trouble getting going. He was finally get, making some inroads, and then suddenly the league says, we, we need you for scheduling purposes. We need you to merge. And he just thought that was the worst idea he'd ever heard. He didn't want to merge with anybody, but the league said, we need you to do this. And he said, okay, I'll do it, because the league says we need to do it. And that was the Steagles year, and the Steagles were actually pretty good. Uh, so they came to him the next year and said, we need you to do it again. He just hated the idea, but he did it because the league needed it. So there he is really putting his franchise, putting the league's uh, interest ahead of his city, its fans, everything. But uh, they're just trying to make it through that war. So uh, they, they did uh, start to realize that, uh, I mean, they, you know, they, they're just constantly doing that after a while, it really just put into your head a sort of a a circle the wagons mentality. We're going to do whatever we have to do uh, to keep this thing going. And then as soon as the war was over, they were immediately challenged by the all American football conference, uh, which was a, a very big threat, easily the biggest they had faced. And so that just galvanized the circling the wagons for sure. All right. So we'll get to that one in a second, but I wanted to maybe just sort of call out another theme that uh, we've kind of danced around uh, in some of our other explorations, not just with football, but other, other leagues and sports and, and arguably, this is probably a way too early to apply label to something circa World War II time. But, um, you know, in, in some respects, yeah, these are franchises, right? So the model, the business model, you know, uh, evolutionary as it may have been at the time, right? Franchise model, owners own their own franchises, and then there is a loose but maybe strengthening collective of rules and uh, concepts and uh, – you know, uh, playing mechanisms and 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 other things that become more formalized by the by the year by the decade. Um, you know, it, but it seems to me though, when when trying to deal with say uh, the challenges of staying afloat during a war, um, it almost feels like the beginnings of I can't think of a better word, like maybe collectivism, or it, it's certainly short of what I guess today would be known as single entity. Um, but I guess I, I really just wonder where that sort of line is based on your research. You know, where is that fine line between, you know, individual uh, franchise ownership and success and and not losing one's shirt mixed with how to take one literally, I would call it for the collective team, that is the league, in a in a manner that is uniform and, and shared risk and shared uh, – shared reward, uh, sacrifice, uh, not unlike what a single entity is all about. Well, they were, they walked that fine line for sure. Uh, they constantly walk that fine line of, uh, taking care of their own and taking care of the league. And, and, uh, I don't think they had any protocol for it. Uh, it was just something that evolved and uh, it was very instinctive and it was, when do we pretty much, they were out for themselves. Uh, however, uh, they would come together at these key moments when they realized we, you know, we, uh, I mean, they would try to certainly try to beat each other on the field and they would, uh, you know, they weren't trying to hurt each other at the gate, but they, they would try to, uh, they would definitely, they were rivals. 
but uh, you know they they did come together at at key moments, and certainly by uh, when the other league, when the All American Football Conference came along uh, in, in 1946, they were extremely concerned, and that heightened their sense of we we have to be in this together. Uh, you know, we we can't let our our rivalries get too crazy because. Uh, you know, we are being we are being challenged here and uh, we're going to still try to beat each other, but we have to be very careful and, and stick together. All right. Time for me to catch my breath, get a cool, tasty beverage and uh, remind you while we do so that uh, our friends at Audible uh, are here to uh, remind you that uh, you can get a free audiobook download. Uh, of your choice from over 180,000 titles. Uh, if you go to audibletrial.com slash good seats and uh, use that link, of course, to uh, try for yourself a free audiobook on us, uh, gratis, if you will. And you will love the idea of audiobooks. It's uh, it's an awesome way to kill time uh, and uh, occupy and stimulate your mind, uh, perhaps when your eyes are busy uh, doing uh, something else. And of course, there are plenty of uh, interesting books to be found, especially in the world of sports and sports history. I think our audience might enjoy a few of these, of course, including uh, the seminal work by uh, baseball uh, legend Jim Bouton. It's called Ball Four. It is uh, not only written, but it's also narrated by him. You could use your free credit for that book. And of course, as you know, Ball Four uh, centers around the 1969 uh, one-year wonder that is the uh, Seattle, was the Seattle Pilots of Major League Baseball, but obviously the uh, the background for a whole lot of other observations about the sport of baseball. And it remains to this day, uh, perhaps uh, one of the most celebrated writings about the sport of baseball uh, in this country. Of course, you can also, if you're not a big baseball fan, you can go into the world of soccer uh, with uh, the autobiography called My Turn by Johan Cruyff, the uh, uh, late Johan Cruyff, uh, perhaps one of the world's best ever uh, soccer players. Uh, he of Dutch heritage, of course. Uh, plenty of uh, a great legendary years at club play as well as national team play uh, for the Dutch team, as well as for our audience, maybe a little bit of interest, uh, his journeys in the North American Soccer League in the late 70s and early 80s with the uh, Washington Diplomats uh, and the uh, Los Angeles Aztecs. And of course, if you're into football, uh, there's probably no better book, especially if you find yourself uh, really interested in the sort of deep and rich history of the NFL with uh, the book called NFL Football, A History of America's New National Pastime. It is written by Richard Crapo and narrated by Marlon May. That, too, uh, is uh, an audiobook that you could choose from over, like I said, uh, 180,000 titles. Uh, there's got to be something in there that's going to be of interest to you. And by all means, give it a try. And we appreciate your doing so at audibletrial.com slash good seats. And again, you're going to get your free uh, audiobook download. You can cancel it any time. And again, even if you cancel it, you can keep that book as long as your device exists. So again, we appreciate it. Give it a try. Audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. Your chapter 18 of this of this book, and it's 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 really extremely well researched. And it's it's uh, to me, it's probably I'm not a football historian by trade, but it feels pretty seminal to me in terms of uh, of the work uh, around the league, especially around this time. Um, you, ch- you titled chapter 18, two wars, uh, and, uh, it, how apt, right? Because you're, you, we've talked about world war two, but this other war more domestically, right? Is this thing called the AAFC, the all America football conference. Um, maybe you can, and we've done a little bit of investigation to some of this, but maybe you can give, uh, our listeners a bit of a sense of, uh, how significant a challenge this was. It seems to me like this was literally the most you know, a gigantic threat to whatever the NFL was staggering out of World War II uh, that they ever faced until that time. Um, and it seemed like there was some big money behind it versus, say, the relatively modest backgrounds of the Big Five here that uh, created and, uh, you know, kept the NFL going through the war. No question about it. The AFC had more money. They, the owners were, were wealthier guys. And uh, the, the story of the league, uh, it, it came out of a personal rivalry 
Uh, George Hallis is one of his closest friends was Arch Ward, the sports editor of the Chicago Tribune, man who invented the baseball all-star game, the college football all-star game, the late, late summer classic. And so Arch was very involved in the NFL in the early going in, in the late thirties, early forties. And Arch wanted to had the idea of maybe having part of a team that were, everybody was looking at that Los Angeles market. And Arch thought, well, I'll take a team there. Well, George Hallis didn't want him to do that because he had promised it to someone else. And he, he didn't want Arch to have that. Arch got mad, cut off their friendship, and started another league. It's basically what happened. It was the end of their friendship. And so, and Arch Ward was a powerful, influential guy. And he found people, uh, you know, with money and people in California, people in the movie business, uh, trucking millionaires. Um, these were not football men, but these were these were men with money. And so and they immediately uh, started raiding the college talent, signing guys. And it was just uh, a full fledged challenge. And, uh, you know, they got really good coaches, Paul Brown and Cleveland, the Cleveland Browns, San Francisco 49ers came out of that league. Uh, there was a original Baltimore Colts franchise. So. Uh, the, the, there was real substance there and uh, for a time really made inroads for a couple of years, 46, 47, really made inroads on, on the NFL. So it, 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 w- it was a major challenge for the NFL. How did they uh, how did they circumvent it and or, uh, you know, pinch it, so to speak? Right. I mean, you, it only lasted four years, this league. Well, I think I think the AFC sort of committed suicide as well. Uh, oddly enough. Uh, uh, what happened? What, what happened? What it lacked was drama. Uh, the draft that had been instituted ten years earlier in the NFL was starting to pay dividends. Once uh, they reinstituted it, and uh, and the, some of the worst teams had, after several years of getting good players like the Cardinals and the Eagles, they were getting good. And so suddenly, the NFL was getting to be quite competitive. The AAFC just didn't have that. The Cleveland Browns, from the get-go, were outstanding. Paul Brown was the coach. They had Hall of Fame players, Marion Motley, and, and you know they were an integrated team, and and they were just excellent. And they just wiped the floor with that league uh, for four straight years. Uh, there was one year where I think only two teams had winning records, the Browns and the 49ers. And so it just got boring, quite simply. The Cleveland Browns were way better than everybody, and it just wasn't very interesting. And then one of the guys, one of the owners had a heart attack, and and uh, when the fans stopped coming because the games weren't that interesting, the owners lost interest, and it just fell away. It was very clear by the last year of the AAFC that they were not going. That was 1949. They were not going to win that war. Uh, the question was, what would happen to these teams? And it was still on the table, but uh, the AFC pretty much uh, committed suicide through lack of competition. Do you think the NFL got lucky, or do you think there were some real machinations behind the scenes that also helped aid and abet the AFC's demise by the NFL? Oh, uh, well, a degree of luck, just because of the nature of the competitor that was, you know, with one team way better than everybody else, That that helps a lot. But by that point, it was not a matter of luck that the NFL was becoming competitive. That was by design through the draft. And the, that had just changed everything. I mean, I, I can't emphasize it enough. For 20 years, it was the Bears and the Giants and uh, the Packers would have their moments, uh, you know, and a few other teams now and then. But it just was uh, not – it was a top-heavy league. And then suddenly it was all changing. Chicago Cardinals won the championship in 47. The Eagles won it in 48 and 49. So the bottom had risen to the top. And it just, that was, this had a huge impact. And that was, that was not luck. That, that was by design. And so it, that came along, that level playing field came along at a crucial time when the AAFC just couldn't sustain it. So essentially by 1950, uh, you, the NFL pretty much, had uh, had beaten off its most significant challenger, and uh, and it survived the war. So it feels to me that uh, the the league was was not only uh, saved, shall we say, and and but was really sort of you know tested and uh, by fire, I guess, and 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 really start to uh, gain more uh, substantial economic uh, roots 
uh, during the course of the 50s. Is that fair? Yes, totally fair. Uh, the first three decades are survival. Uh, and then once the AFC is done with, they are going to survive. They've annexed the Browns. They've annexed the 49ers, strong franchises. Uh, so that's just sort of giving them broader shoulders. And then uh, you talk about luck. I mean, then television suddenly is arriving as an industry. And for the first time, <clears throat> there's real money on the table. And how, and how are we going to carve this up? What are we going to do with it? It took them a while to figure it out. But yes, uh, once the AFC was gone and suddenly the television cameras were, the red light was on, uh, they were starting to, it changed. It changed to not survival anymore, but to growth. We are going to grow. And um, that, that is what the 50s is all about. That is when you see pro football. I don't have the number in front of me, but I believe the average attendance at a game was 23,000 or something at the start of the decade. And it was n not quite double that, but close by the end of the decade of the 50s. Just a tremendous era of growth with uh, the, the country really discovering professional football. Uh, a lot of people buy a television and uh, the game opening up at the right time. All the rules I talked about with the past, a key one. A totally key one is the unlimited substitution rule. Uh, there had been limits on substitutions in football forever. The college game still had l severe limits on cut substitution. There were a lot of two-way players. Uh, the NFL went with unlimited substitutions, which uh, actually the AAFC is something that came out of the AAFC. They adopted it. And suddenly you had two platoon football. You had specialization. You had these great quarterbacks like Johnny Unitas that didn't have to play defensive back he could spec just just worry on his just worry about his talent the one thing he was great at throwing the football so suddenly the, the talent level was just shooting through the roof uh with specialization and two platoon football uh, being shown on television and the country discovered it and suddenly it was just how high can we go not whether we can go at all so so talk to me about the the college game versus the pro game uh, maybe you know before and and then during the 50s, right? Because um, the college game had always been uh, quite alluring, quite successful, quite well attended, uh, even when the NFL sort of uh, started to get its act together and, and, and try to professionalize the sport. Um, aside from, say, a couple of rules changes, I mean, what what was the how was the NFL distinguishing itself and the professional version of the game versus uh, what I would imagine would be really as a a solid head start that the college game had had for, for many decades. So oh, many decades, college game had pageantry. It had rivalries. It had tradition. It had sellout crowds, much more exciting media coverage, but uh, the NFL was catching up finally. And what it had uh, that the college game just didn't have, and this is in the fifties, you see it is the talent just under the the you could turn on a pro football game and watch uh, i'll go back to johnny unitas again uh there was no one in college football that could throw thread a needle like he could that could uh, drive a team down the field 80 yards just pinpoint zipping passes around uh they just and, and there were other quarterbacks. They had there were other quarterbacks like that in the league. Bob Waterfield, Otto Graham, Bobby Lane had all these field generals, for lack of a better term. And uh, you just and then on defense, you had guys like Sam Huff, just these these uh, violent, uh, hard hitting players. So uh, uh, the things that we would the country would come to love about football, the violence, just the hard hitting, uh, uh, the size of the guys. I mean. Let's go back to the very beginning. You know, what they thought, what these guys thought would be great was grown men playing football, not high school kids and college kids. They thought, let's get guys that are out of college. Wouldn't it be that much better? And really, that's what happened. You had men who were bigger, faster, stronger, tougher. And so the game was just played at a higher level. And suddenly the country could see that. And, you know, college football remains huge. It remains popular. And, 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 you know, people love the pageantry, the tradition, the rivalries, the game, and it's still popular. I mean, it's just a, it's tremendous sport, but, uh, you know, if you really wanted to see football played at a, at a high level 
that's what the NFL gave you. And the country just took to it. And and I and, I, and you mentioned television, right? It, it also, you know, TV obviously introduced the sport to, you know, many, many more people than the handful of cities that were lucky enough to have franchises and obviously transformed all sports, baseball uh, as well, of course, at that time, especially. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a couple of interesting little anecdotes and, and, and chapters in this, like one called the little black box chapter 23, if you're following along at home with your cliff notes, um, <laughs> you know, that little black box, right. Uh, you know, you fast forward to today, which seems obvious, right. But, um, you could make the argument that television, um, I don't know if it made the NFL, but it certainly made it more uh, economically viable and successful, right? Oh, boy, night and day. Night and day. As I said, there really wasn't a lot of money on the table before. They they, they were worried if they would get uh, revenue from tickets and a little bit from radio rights. And that was it. And advertising Advert, you know, in the program, <laughs> whatever ads they could get. They didn't have a lot of income streams. Tickets were the main thing, and they were initially terrified, terrified of television. How in the world could you put a home game on TV? And if you give your game away for free, no one will come. And so uh, they didn't want to do that, and they were very worried about it. George Hallis just I, – I use – the Bears uh, in my TV chapter as the example of, of how the league used TV. And he sort of went back and forth. He embraced it. Then he, he didn't want it. And then in the end, he realized we, we have to figure this out because um, they, it was just too powerful. And they finally figured out the way to do it. You may not want to put it on the home games on in your city, but it was great advertising free advertising to to put these games on and people in outlying cities wanted to watch it you could create new fans and, and not in chicago by the end of the 50s before there was a national television contract the bears had a network of affiliates in different cities that turned on that that took the signal for the bears game for three hours every sunday and this was all over Nashville. I mean, not just in the Midwest. It was all over. Some of it was even in Florida. Over 70 cities were watching the Bears. So he was raking it in. He was absolutely raking it in by then. So real money on the table. And they took him a while to sort of figure it out. And then, of course, in the early 60s, they signed national TV contracts. And they started to share the wealth uh, because uh, the, those regional networks sort of created a have-have-not uh, that, that sort of reopened. The Bears had 70 networks and the Packers or the Eagles had like five. So that, that wasn't going to work. Uh, so they, they went with a, a national TV contract. But uh, the, by the, the TV was the economic game changer of all time for, for pro football, really for any sport, but certainly more, pro football most of all. Yeah, before the, the sort of the uh, uniform uh, national contracts, right? And, and I would go back now, like to the Dumont Network and all these other other sort of situations, right? But um, I'm wondering how that all sort of uh, came into into play because it seems to me that uh, you know you're mentioning sort of a a, a widely regional sort of uh, uh, footprint for Chicago Bear games, um, but it also reminds me, I guess, of uh, I guess what the, of the Washington Redskins at the time, George Pre- George Preston Marshall's. Uh, franchise who uh, I think by all accounts was uh, sort of looked upon um, by the NFL as basically being the quote unquote Southern market franchise, right? Washington, D.C. and yep. all points sort of South and Southwest, right? Um, yep. An issue that comes up uh, in our previous chat, right? When uh, when Dallas uh, become became the uh, uh, unwitting sort of uh, 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 battleground for both leagues in, in one city and one stadium for that matter, right? Yes, the Redskins had sold that for years. Uh, they moved. They started in Boston. They moved to Washington in 1937. They were hugely successful right away. They had Sammy Baugh, and uh, the George Preston Marshall moved them from Boston to Washington with the idea that he would sell them as the and the pro team in the South. All these great college football uh, cities and fans in Florida and Tennessee and Louisiana and Texas everywhere. They didn't have anyone to root for on Sunday. So let's give them a team to root for on Sunday, the Redskins. So uh, it was by design. We're going to draft players from there as much as we can. Uh, of course, all white players. I mean, they were just, uh, you know, they were the last team, NFL team to integrate. They didn't integrate until the 1960s. 
just a horrible embarrassment for the league. Uh, George Preston Marshall became an embarrassment for the league uh, with his sort of racial, his racist uh, policies. But, uh, uh, you know, he he was wanted to control that southern market. And, and Hallis had 70 something. I, I, I know. I mean, it worked. It worked for a long time. The Redskins had 30 or 40, at least 30 or 40. Uh, uh, affiliates in the throughout the South, they would barnstorm there in the preseason. They they were the South team. So, okay. So here's a naive question, but but maybe in hind, another hindsight uh, is clarity. Um, what what it, did it take the AFL and its arrival in 1960 uh, to uh, shake? Um, not only the, the ch- once again, another existential threat, but when it comes to television, was that sort of the, 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 the thing that kind of uh, shook the, the owners into understanding that national television could be a thing and, and maybe that they needed to, because I, 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 what I find hard to believe is that um, the competition, I guess, for regional networks, if you will, by team wouldn't have gotten, I don't know, internally contentious, contentious, excuse me. Uh, amongst some of, the, some of the owners and maybe some of the franchises that are were not in the richest TV markets or geographically best suited? Well, I, I didn't come across any examples of those arguments, but I am sure they existed. You're right. Uh, they were, you know, biting over Orlando or or whatever it might be, just anyone. So uh, the, the, the AFL, they copycatted. Uh, the NFL copied the AFL. Lamar Hunt was the one that said, we're going to share this money. And, and uh, he started the AFL. And of course, those teams didn't have any money uh, starting out. They were starting from scratch. And they said, well, we're going to share the TV money. So the NFL uh, copied that well, within a year. Uh, you know, they don't like to admit that, but it's true. They, they copied the AFL on that. And uh, it, was a, it was a brilliant idea. Once again, it leveled the playing field. Green Bay Packers were getting ready to go out of existence in the late 50s. Uh, before the year before Lombardi got there, they didn't win a game, and uh, I mean they they were they were just horrible. And then uh, two things happen: they bring in Lombardi, and then the TV money starts coming in, and so they're not out of existence. And then they they dominated the league in the 1960s. All right, well, let's talk about the AFL because that seems to me sort of uh, maybe one of the um, sort of final tent poles in in your story for this sort of. Uh, genre, but I, I think it's really important to remember and understand. And and like I said we, before, we had uh, we had Bert Bell's son uh, Upton on uh, with a very very interesting conversation about lots of different things, both uh, AFL and NFL, and uh, and and oddly enough, the WFL. Whole another story. But I think a lot of people forget the fact that uh, Bert Bell, right, the commissioner of the league through much of the fifties, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, died tragically and maybe almost even, um, uh, you know, almost, uh, um, uh, I, I don't know how best put Poetically. It. Yeah, poetically <laughs> in, in the stands, right, in 1959. And, and what a shock to this league that had, you know, started to really grow and thrive in the 1950s, yet here knocking on the door uh, as Burt Bell uh, passes, passes away, uh, another substantial existential threat and one – uh, that had learned some very solid lessons from the 1950s and television in particular uh, to give the NFL another kick in the butt and then some. Well, the 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 germ of that here is pretty much what happened. I can I see it globally now a lot clearer. Is what happened is uh, uh, in, in the 50s when suddenly, as I said, there was money on the table and teams were starting to succeed and attendance was growing. It was clear pro football was taking off and a lot of cities wanted in, just a bunch of them. And, uh, you know, Miami, Dallas, Atlanta, New Orleans, Kansas City, on and on. And uh, Hallis and those guys running the league, still running the league, did not want to carve up the money. They were very hesitant. They worked so hard to get where they were, and they did not want to expand, period. George Hallis was the expansion committee. The NFL had an expansion committee. It was George Hallis, and it never met. And so they just were not going to expand. And so Lamar Hunt in Dallas uh, is wealthier than all these other guys put together. uh, 26 years old, uh, decides to start his own league. And so he just suddenly realized there were enough cities that wanted in. And the NFL had dragged his feet so long that Congress was uh, investigating some antitrust uh, questions. 
uh, sniffing around at least. Uh, so uh, suddenly when the, the AFL started, the NFL realized it needed to expand and there was a team in Dallas, there was a team in Minnesota and it expanded throughout the 60s. But the AFL is what caused the NFL to expand and sort of come to its senses and to give up the ghost of being, we're just going to be this nice little league. Uh, the AFL sort of slapped it into, you know, the slapped some sense into it. And said, oh, my gosh, you know, with this, we're big business now. we got to deal with this. So explain to me then how the league, you know, um, obviously the 1960s, very, uh, very transformational for the, pro, for the pro football game. Obviously, the AFL, you know, taught the league a bunch of different things. Um, obviously, it, it netted into uh, the merger of all mergers. Um, but ironically, it um, it made the NFL stronger uh, going forward. But it didn't stop. The, the constant and continual, and, and again, the next two years, challenge to this thing called pro football that the NFL still has a effective de facto monopoly on. What, what is it about this league and maybe some of the, the germs of its uh, inception and its, its running in its toughest times that just that not only allows it to continue to, su- to succeed, it seems, against all odds, but also continue to generate challengers to the crown well i i think it's success i think i don't know if that was the case in the 20s and the 30s uh, uh I, it certainly was the case with the american football league of 1960 that they saw that the nfl was succeeding and there was all these businessmen wanted in and so since that point in time it has been a real profit engine and uh, it is successful and so there are, that's just, I think, human nature. There are people that think, oh, well, we can do that. Maybe we can do it better. There's always challenges. Certainly the NFL is facing enormous challenges right now with, uh, you know, the head trauma and the, 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 the question whether football is even good for you, good for your health. A tremendous fundamental question. The NFL is facing that. However, the, the appetite for the sport remains so high that, uh, you know, there's all, always, it seems almost always, there's people, you know, in the 80s, it was the USFL. There's always people coming along saying, well, there's enough for us and we can take this thing on and we can succeed. And so it just, it's the success of the NFL, I think, that causes people to want to get into the sport and see if they can carve out a piece of the pie. I think it's also pretty telling that um, uh, the heirs to the Hallis, Mara, and Rooney families are still <clears throat> part of the NFL, uh, and then some. Um, you know, I, I think that's a testament, I guess, to the the history and the heritage. But you wonder uh, in you know where all the money is now, and and the value of franchises, and the revenue streams, and the you know the the arms race and stadiums and. And the television money and, and who knows what comes from digital media and all these kinds of things, um, whether those uh, those legacies, uh, you know, can continue or frankly, quote unquote, keep up with the literal and figurative Joneses in this league. <laughs> well, that's a good question. There's, those are good franchises still. The brand is unbelievably powerful. Uh, I have noticed just sort of observing those old line franchises to these families. Uh, they tend to run their teams with a little less frantic. They're a little calmer. They don't always succeed. They go through periods. Uh, you know, they don't make every right choice, but the giants certainly are an example. You know, they're pretty methodical and they try to, even when things aren't going right, they try to, uh, you know, they sort of button down sort of old school, and I don't know. They, 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 there's plenty of money. I mean, they're they're worth these these Forbes valuations for sure. These teams are worth a fortune. I think they can keep up. Uh, I mean, it started out as just a family business, but uh, the family business is now as big a business as you'll find in sports. Any of these NFL teams. So uh, by by having the, the family business grew. Uh, you know, and these are people that are pretty good at the football business. They've been at it a long time. They have a lot of the right instincts, and I think they can keep up. I think those you got Bidwill in Arizona. Same things going on there. There's another one that family. Uh, I think they can keep up, and and uh, uh, you know, this day and age, owners get local governments involved if they can, 
and uh, the the brand itself is unbelievably powerful. So uh, uh, there's a lot of forces that you can uh, set in motion on your behalf. All right, last question. In in your research for this book, and and you're putting it together, and obviously, you know, having been around the game for for uh, you know for for decades as a, as a journalist and, and covering the sport, was there anything that you kind of uh, were surprised by or uh, that you maybe didn't know going into this adventure uh, as you delved back into the the origins and then the earliest days of this league? Like, did, did anything sort of jump out and surprise you? Or was there an anecdote or some kind of some kind of uh, uh, thing that happened that, uh, that, that you just were truly taken by surprise? Because it seems like there's a lot of uh, uh, dusty boxes of, uh, of, of uh, stories there that uh, may have been uh, maybe unearthed or at least tipped over. <laughs> Well, I was surprised by a lot of it. Uh, I was surprised by the fly-by-night nature of the league. Could not believe that teams would just come and go in a year, and and uh, they were constantly reshaping the league and making stuff up as they went along. Uh, I, I guess I just didn't realize the depth to which they were resorting to to keep that going. I guess if there's any story that surprised me, it just I mean, what surprised me, I think, in the long run was these guys I wrote about, as, as we said earlier, they, they just, it's just not a money story. You know, all we think of today is sports and money. They're just so intertwined. These guys are, I mean, it, it is an, it's an entrepreneurship story. It's a business tale, how they survive, but there was just not money there. George Hallis, George Hallis in 1932, the depth of the depression paid his players with IOUs. He did not have money to pay Bronco Nagurski and Red Grange. He paid them with IOUs, and they took the IOUs. That is the amazing thing. His grandson told me that story, and the most amazing part of it is that they took it. They took an IOU from George Alice because he didn't have money to pay them, and so they believe some sort of faith in the future of the sport. But I just didn't realize how there was just no money at all. These guys were not wealthy. They were just winging it, and... Uh, I, I I was, as I researched, amazed at sort of the slapdash uh, nature of the whole enterprise there for quite a while. Just uh, made for fascinating research and storytelling. Do you think any of these original men, uh, especially the ones that you highlighted, would ever have envisioned how uh, economically and societally uh, successful uh, this league would ultimately be? <laughs> Well, uh, the last two to die were Rooney. Uh, Art Rooney lived into the late 80s. He saw the, Super, the Steelers win four Super Bowls, and he, he did see it. I, I think he was pretty surprised. Hallis died in the early 80s. He saw it, and so they did see what was happening, and uh, I don't know whether it surprised them. I, they certainly could see the big picture, and so in the long run, it probably did surprise them, the, the, the amount of success, the incredible success. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe Tim Mara, these guys were a little older, Burt Bell, I'm, I'm sure they, Burt Bell just would have been amazed at the, the, the amount of money that was on the table, uh, and the amount of money today. I think anybody that was involved in the league, the first half century of the league would be shocked at what's happening now. All right. This, this is my last question. I promise. Um, looking into your crystal ball again, giving all your experience as well as all the research you've done for this book and a bunch of others in the football f- field. Where do you think the league goes from here? I mean, good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, are we at peak NFL now? Um, or, you know, I, from a media perspective, from a health perspective, from a, you know, a legacy pension and, and remembrance of, of players who gave their all perspective from a, I, I don't know, just you know, from a, a racial uh, uh, integration perspective. seems like there's so many threats. It almost feels like multiple yeah. existential threats these days. Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to get any much bigger than it is now, uh, and maybe five to ten years ago, uh, before some of these challenges sort of started to crystallize, maybe sort of a peak period. But uh, I mean, they, they certainly they continue to generate unbelievable, you know, billions in revenues. But uh, I don't know that it. I, I I think from a business term, they may be a little tapped out here in the, in the United States. I don't know that they can make. Uh, you know, they can expect too much more other than uh, the price of, of various things going up. So I'm not sure it's going to get a whole lot bigger. Uh, you know, I see, uh, you know, and I'm in the league now. I mean, I'm a, 
I uh, write columns for the Baltimore Ravens and, and, uh, you know, I watch sort of internally people, uh, dealing with things and I can speak from experience. There is great concern inside this league about what this head trauma means and, and, and the various challenges, uh, you know, it, they are real and, uh, the league is, is trying pretty close to desperately to, to, to keep the players healthy and, and, uh, fend that off and whether they can, I don't know. Uh, I think it's a real challenge, something to worry about. The smart people in the league are worried about it. So, uh, you know, I think that's uh, that's next. I mean, the appetite for the game continues, unbelievable ratings and, and interest, but uh, there are definitely rumblings that, that give you pause. Well, I, uh, I congratulate you on this book, and I, I highly recommend it because I think, um, you know, when things get challenging, I think you, you know, maybe go back and, and look at sort of the origins and the core and, and sort of the – the things that kind of uh, set the table to get you to where uh, uh, you are now. And I can't think of a better way to uh, to do that if you're involved in pro football or considering becoming part of it than by going back and reading The League by by our guest John Eisenberg in in understanding how this thing got uh, got started in the first place. And, you know, maybe some back to basics uh, could have some, uh, some lessons in history. Uh, there is, uh, you know, future learnings, right? And – um, I, I, it's, it's a great work. I think it's fantastic. And I think it's, uh, it's probably something that, uh, I know this is kind of trite, but you know, there's a whole generation or two, uh, of current, uh, NFL football fans that, uh, you know, frankly don't understand, uh, how this league sort of came to be. And they don't understand some of these names and the franchises that maybe they didn't know about or existed or, or just the history of the ones that do exist, right. That, um, you know, I, as people sort of go back and sort of understand, they can sort of get a better sense that, um, you know, that uh, things are not always a direct path to uh, to stardom and to greatness. And uh, certainly the NFL has had its uh, shares of <laughs> ups and downs and, and sideways uh, stories. So um, I really appreciate your uh, taking this second opportunity to chat with us. Oh, it was my pleasure. And uh, I appreciate the interest. And uh, thanks for the kind words. Uh, I take it as high praise. All right, the uh, name of the book is called The League, How Five Rivals Created the NFL and Launched a Sports Empire. It is published by Basic Books. Uh, it just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. It is a uh, a very good read. It is an excellent uh, synopsis and a detailed uh, story, uh, an account of the early days of the NFL, the, uh, the uh, early decades of the NFL, and uh, the... Uh, the the existential threats to the NFL over those years, uh, and um, you know, again, this is the uh, the foundation upon which uh, the today's current uh, uh, crazily su- successful uh, warts and all NFL uh, sort of uh, exists today. And and uh, without sort of these uh, seminal events and these uh, 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 just the, the wherewithal of uh, of some of these founders. Uh, to keep this thing uh, alive and going and ultimately thriving. It's uh, it's fascinating stuff. And if you consider yourself uh, a fan of the NFL or pro football or just football generally, uh, you owe it to yourself to school yourself a bit. Uh, and uh, this is a, a great accessible way to do so. Uh, the League by John Eisenberg. Highly recommended. Uh, and you can find a link to this book as well as, uh, as this episode on our website, of course, at Good Seats still available.com uh, just search up this episode with john eisenberg uh, hell even the other episode that we just did a couple of weeks back with john about the uh the uh, uh battle for uh, pro football supremacy uh, in dallas in the early 60s that uh, being the 10 gallon war the name of that book uh, the battle between uh, the afl's texans and the nfl's cowboys uh you will find a link to that too on this episode and we'll also put a link to uh, the, uh, both of those books in, in the previous episode as well. Just just search it up, will you? Just go to the website, Good Seats, still available.com, and you click on that link and it'll take you to, uh, to Amazon. Uh, and we'll get a couple of shekels if you buy the book that way. And you probably won't be able to find the book any cheaper anyway. So why not, by God's sake, you know, go for it. And um, we, and of course, all of our authors appreciate when you do that. And um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff there too at Good Seats, still available.com, including. You know, the 80 some odd uh, other episodes that we've uh, lovingly crafted for you and put out there into the interwebs. And uh, you can listen to or stream those. You can download them. You can do whatever you want there. 
Uh, you'll find all the links to the books and the various movies and other other things. You'll see some some cool imagery for a lot of the episodes and stuff. Uh, and it's your source, frankly, for anything that's going on with this show. And we've got lots coming up, trust me. Uh, and uh, beyond that, you'll be able to find all of our social media links, of course. Uh, at Twitter, we're at Good Seats Still. You'll find us uh, on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. You can follow us on Facebook. we got a page there devoted to us. Uh, you can send us some email. Why not at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And hell, that's, uh, you know, it's multiple ways to uh, to get in touch and to, to be involved. Uh, give us your, your suggestions, uh, your likes, your wants, your needs, whatever. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to... Uh, to uh, connect and uh, and hear more about what you like, uh, maybe even what you don't like about this uh, this little show. Um, again, we also want to remind you, and this is really important. Go, please, whatever you do, go to Apple iTunes or, or Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever you listen to this show. If there's an opportunity to rate or review or give it some stars, uh, we can't thank you more uh, enough than to do that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if you can't, uh, spend any money on uh, our books or, uh, you know, spend some shekels with some of our sponsors, uh, the least you could do if you really like what you hear, uh, is to give us uh, some ratings and reviews in any and all of those places. Uh, that really helps the show. It gets us found, it gets us discovered, it gets us recommended to people who might, uh, similarly enjoy, uh, this show that you enjoy and, uh, you know, obviously tell your friends and so on. But uh, online uh, uh, goodness and thumbs up and stars and all that kind of stuff don't hurt either. And we appreciate you doing so for that. Uh, and last but not least, we uh, also appreciate, of course, uh, the uh, yeoman like work that our friend Jerry Payne and his friends at Podfly Productions do every week on this show. We thank them tremendously. Podfly.net, that's how you can find out about more uh, podcast production and editing goodness. Uh, from our friends there at Podfly Productions. Again, podfly.net. Check them out early, check them out often, and tell them that your pal Tim sent you. Okay, uh, we send you on your way, and we appreciate to no end you're listening to this this little silly show, and uh, we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. Take care. Drive safe.